management class or a work class in sociology. You always read about uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor and scientific management. Mass production, uh, what was referred to as Fordism based on Henry Ford and the assembly line and so on. Uh, much of these two different kinds of theories still exist to a certain degree, but uh, for the most part, the new division of labor has supplanted this. Uh, much of this was kind of inspired by a book in 1974 that, that was about the division of labor by Harry Braverman. Uh, and, uh, and I basically started getting the feeling that lean production is really a breakthrough, you know, equivalent to Braverman or equivalent to to uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor and so on, but it's just not getting the attention uh, that it really should get. So consequently, that's why we kind of came up with this idea of this new dominant division of labor for the next 50 or 100 years. So what are the cast of characters? Who are the candidates for the new division of labor? Uh, we have the uh, usual suspects like uh, Claude Rains and, as the police uh, commissioner in Casablanca. Go round up the usual suspects. Well, here they are. Five suspects. Post-Fordism, sometimes referred to as neoliberalism. McDonaldization. Uh, Waltonism, uh, based on Walmart for the most part. Nightification. Sometimes Gatesism <coughs> comes in on that. And then we have lean production and Toyotism. So what I'd like to do today is just talk through those five different points and sort of aggregate them and try to make sense of all these different kinds of approaches to the division of labor. Post-Fordism post -Fordism, post -Fordism is probably my least favorite theory. I really don't like theories that are post something because they tell you what was, they don't tell you, you know, what's, what's coming about. But nevertheless, this has been a fairly popular theory with uh, flexible production being the base of, of this theory. Uh, and also uh, world production in terms of uh, world demand and so on. Uh, and I won't spend too much time on this, just that uh, something that says post doesn't give you enough detail about what it actually is. And that's the fact of this theory. It just doesn't give you enough information as to what, you know, what's really, what's really coming after borders. McDonaldization. Well, I think we're all familiar with McDonald's, how McDonald's operates. Uh, it's, this has been a very popular theory with uh, George Britzer, who's basically used Max Weber's theory of bureaucracy and iron cages and so on. Uh, it's, uh, he's published like six books on this topic, and McDonaldization as a process is, you know, based on efficiency, calculation, predictability, control, and so on is a very effective theory, but what is this? This is just Taylorism and mass production, Fordism all over again. There's nothing, there's nothing new here. One little thing that he does mention though that doesn't get uh, too much attention, gets into some of his later books, is uh, emotion management. There is a certain amount to McDonald's of emotion management uh, about you know, how the customer is encountered and also in terms of their advertising. But for the most part, McDonaldization is just too much of, you know, Fordism, too much of mass production, and so on. Flipping the burger on the assembly line instead of, uh, you know, doing the sort of same sort of thing. And it also kind of lacks the equivalent of the five-hour, uh, five-hour, what was it, five-hour week or five-hour day? It's five-hour five day. Five-hour day. Five-dollar day, right. Which was a high wage. Mm -hmm. And McDonald's certainly certainly doesn't pay a high wage. A third candidate, Waltonism. Waltonism uh, comes from Matt Vidal and Gary Hamilton, of course based on Walmart. And Walmart has become the biggest employer in, in the United States at this point in time. They have tremendous, tremendous market power. Uh, a very important aspect of their market power is supply chain management and basically getting subcontractors into a room and basically negotiating the lowest possible price that they can get from those subcontractors. Well, they did this for a long period of time in the United States, and then they basically said, you know, we could do this a whole lot better by just moving to China and offshoring everything. So, so not that uh, Walmart produces things, they're really a merchandiser 
kind of uh, kind of model. So to a certain degree, Waltonism is one of these uh, one of these candidates, and they do an effective job pursuing these uh, low prices, and uh, they have some problems concerning treatment of employees. They pay pretty pretty low wages and and so on. They add a number of charges of discrimination and, and so on, and they can basically get their way. But the biggest problem with this, to say that Waltonism is the future of the division of labor in the world, is that it's a merchandising model. They don't really make anything. You know, they, you know, they sell things in a store, which we're all pretty, pretty aware of. So, so, so to a certain degree, there's, there's a certain principle there that, that is important, but it's just not a big enough model to work for, you know, the global, global economy. Nikeification. This is one of the really big kinds of models that's uh, developed. Uh, you know, I name it after Nike because Nike was the first, what I refer to as the donut corporation. It has a hole in the middle. You know, the hole is it doesn't produce in the United States. You know, it has lots of organizational uh, things with marketing and so on in the United States. It has strong supply chain management. It has a problem solving culture and so on, but it just doesn't produce in the United States. And it really started right from the beginning, producing in, first of all, Japan and then producing, producing in China. Uh, so this model is becoming quite popular in a number, number of uh, different ways. Uh, Nike started out uh, with uh, Phil Knight basically uh, offering to produce a Japanese company's shoes in the United States and market them and so on, and subsequently started his own, his own uh, home company. Much of this is made possible by a revolution in transportation uh, consisting of the, uh, of the container ship. Uh, container ship containing 20-foot equivalent uh, containers, TEUs. Uh, these TEUs have become massive ships. Uh, it's a picture of a ship that's loaded with all the containers on top. Here's one that's empty. Uh, uh, just to add on, they also had the row row ships, the roll on, roll off for, for vehicles and so on. Uh, <coughs> these, these ships are incredibly, incredibly large. Offshoring would not be possible without <coughs> these kinds of ships. They started out in the 50s with 50, 52 uh, containers. And we've gotten up to the point of 2008 with the Marist Triple E in 18,000 containers. That is just a massive amount of material to be able to ship to, to the United States for a relatively, relatively low cost. So technology is a really big part of this, uh, this kind of approach. Now, it's not just Nike. There's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of other companies. And uh, Apple, uh, one of the most popular high-tech companies in the United States, the most capitalized company in, in the world at this point in time, uh, doesn't produce anything in the United States, you know, other than advertisements and marketing material. Everything's made by, mainly by Foxconn in, in China. Uh, and, uh, and I talk to my students in my class all the time and ask them, you know, is a, you know to talk about smartphones and things like that. And, uh, they just love Apple. You know, Apple's the greatest thing ever. There's nothing wrong with Apple, even though all of this is being all of this is being produced over overseas. So this is another example of a donut corporation. IBM has basically got out of the business of producing uh, material goods. They're basically offering services uh, by by themselves. General Electric has become kind of the poster or at least it was the poster, poster uh, corporation for offshoring with Jack Welch, whose picture is up in the corner, who came up with a 70-70-70 rule, 70% of business should be outsourced, 70% offshore, 70% offshore to, to India, and that we should also put factories on barges and move them wherever the wages, wages are the lowest. So a critique of nitrification the biggest problem is that the production doesn't occur in the United States uh, and it entails this massive offshoring. 
uh, the subcontracting that subsequently goes on in these other countries is more than what people would have made on the villages back in the hinterlands. But nevertheless, it's a pretty low wage uh, worldwide. Some people, such as James Fowles, refer to this as Dickensian labor in the sense that uh, labor is like Bleak House, and David Copperfield, and Oliver Twist, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem with this. Uh, the fifth item is lean production. Uh, I just put Jeffrey Liker's picture up here because I think he has a nice summary in his book, uh, The Toyota Way. Uh, four basic principles, and I'm going to basically look at these different methods of the international division of labor based on these four principles. One, a long-term philosophy, hiring workers for the long term, producing for the long term, not being concerned with short-term stock prices, but being more concerned with market share and expanding your business and expanding employment. Second, a supply chain network based on just-in-time inventory, uh, which you know fits into uh, suppliers and uh, coordinating, coordinating them in a number of ways. Third, a problem-solving culture that focuses on quality. And fourth, the use of strong teams, especially teams that are five to eight, uh, have five to eight members and, and so on. So these four principles are what we're looking at in terms of lean, lean production. Uh, I'm probably emphasizing the strong teams a little bit more than, than many other uh, versions of lean production do, but I think, uh, I think it's an important part, part of the model in a number of different ways. Uh, lean production is kind of an unfortunate name. Uh, I would like to get rid of the name lean production, uh, but I don't like swimming upstream. So, you know, it would just be way too much work to try to change the name of lean production. Part of the problem with the name lean production is that it implies that you're always cutting. And the thing is, oftentimes, uh, Toyota and other types of uh, corporations that use this method actually have a surplus of labor in a number, number of different ways. Plus, the long-term philosophy doesn't fit the cutting so much. But the thing is, you know, I, I think it's just so much so ingrained at this point in time, it's not worth the effort to fight against it. So I often use lean production slash Toyotism, because I think Toyotism kind of uh, exemplifies the model uh, well. Uh, the term lean production was come up, came up with uh, by uh, John Krasick, who's now uh, 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 head of uh, Head of Hyundai, uh, America, North America, uh, and so on, popularized by Womack, but obviously started by a combination of Americans in terms of Deming and a number of other people basically coming out of the Bell Labs tradition and a number of uh, Japanese uh, uh, professors or workers for, for Toyota, Ono and, uh, and Ishikawa especially. So Toyota is primarily the example of this uh, of this model, and uh, I have you know some some criticisms of Toyota, but for the most part, implementing those four basic aspects of lean production, I think, is something that basically benefits benefits uh, production in, in the United States and other places. Let's see, just on these four slides, I just go <coughs> into more detail about the four different things, so I'll just I'll just skip skip over them. Okay, so let's see, I kind of got cut off the top. Well, basically what I'm going to say here is that lean production, taking these five different models, I believe, or we believe is uh, composed of three different types. First of all, lean production one, which uses all four elements of lean production, especially the teams and also <coughs> the long-term philosophy. Lean production two, addresses two, maybe sometimes three, of the different sorts of uh, aspects of lean production, but it casts off one of those uh, aspects, especially uh, teamwork. If you don't produce, and I'm focusing mainly on production, so if you don't produce, if you don't produce the stuff yourself, then, then you, know, you really don't have the teams to subsequently do it. So Nike kind of fits into that category, but nevertheless, I'm saying this, this is one style of lean production. Lean production three is kind of the Waltonism, so consequently you have merchandisers who exert great pressure on uh, 
subcontractors and suppliers and so on. So lean production consists, you know, we're making the argument, lean production consists of these three different kinds of, uh, different kinds of uh, corporations. So for the most part, lean production too lacks the long-term perspective and doesn't use the teams. It's pretty good at the supply chain network. It's quite good at a problem solving culture and, and so on. So what are the consequences of these three models of lean production? Uh, the lean production one with, uh, with uh, Toyotism and so on uh, has one weakness and that is it does a lot of outsourcing. It uses a lot of temporary employees and so on. And so to a certain degree, this, this is one problematic aspect of this approach. It seems to be pretty consistent on wanting to use those temporary temporary employees. They're not all temporary, but they, they use a buffer of temporary employees. But in terms of onshoring, uh, Toyotism for the most part produces, you know, uh, Toyota for instance produces in the United States. Honda produces in the United States. They use a lot of suppliers from the United States. They're focused much more on employment and expanding market share. Uh, they have an emphasis on relatively high wages. One exception are the temps. You know, when the temps come in, they get a lower wage. Uh, but once you're an established associate, you usually make a higher wage. Uh, and balance of payments. If you produce onshore, uh, if you, uh, you know, create more jobs in the United States, that's going to alleviate balance of payments problems. If you look at the consequences of LP2, lean production three, you have the outsourcing, which is similar to the first one. Then you have a heck of a lot of offshoring. You have structural unemployment that basically comes as a consequence of doing that offshoring. And that then produces a great deal of inequality and hollowing out of the middle class that uh, President Obama likes to talk about as much. And the balance of payments subsequently becomes a major, major problem. Why is the balance of payments a problem? Well, the last year that the United States had a positive balance of trade was in 1975. We're buying more stuff from the rest of the world than we're selling to the rest of the world. What happens after 20, 30, or 40 years of doing that? China owns most of your debt. And I don't really want to single out China because debt is spread out to a lot of, a lot of different countries. In fact, too much is made of China owning debt. debt is, owned by lots of people around the world. Uh, so consequently, if you, have, if you have a balance of trade, and the balance of trade here is uh, symbolized, by the, uh, symbolized by the red line, uh, subsequently, you know, you're eventually going to run into problems. The deficit right now, the fiscal cliff, is nothing compared to this. This is really what the root problem is. Now, that then divided up the balance of trade between goods and services. Services are up at the top. Goods are down at the bottom. What are goods? Well, a big part of goods are manufacturing. But it's not all manufacturing. It's also exports of cotton, corn, you know, uh, agricultural products, and, and so on. But the basic point I want to make here is that many people say we've moved from a uh, we've moved from the uh, manufacturing society to a service society. And that's certainly true. You know, we've dropped a lot of manufacturing. We've embraced a lot of services. But when it comes to exporting services, which is the dotted green line up at the top, how much can we export? Are we going to export our elementary teachers, you know, to countries all around the world? You know, it just doesn't work. You know, when you get sick, you get sick here. You know, you need a nurse here. You know, and so on and so forth. You can export some services but it's obviously very clear that the United States cannot export enough services to make up for thousands of Walmarts selling us all sorts of electronic and other kinds of goods that are subsequently being produced uh, in, in other parts of the world. So consequently, this, this is the real problem and the biggest problem concerning LP2, or Lean Production 2, which is the Dodona Corporation basically, you know, is doing their production, production overseas. 
Another aspect of, say, Toyotism and Fordism is that sometimes people connect politics to this. They say the welfare state, uh, Keynesianism, unionism are part of the old Fordist model. The new lean production model, some people imply involves neoliberalism, cutting, and so on. Uh, I think that's an interesting point. I'm not going to argue extensively for that. But uh, nevertheless, it's uh, something that people talk about at various points in time. So basically, in conclusion, what's the future of the division of labor? After looking at five different types of the division of labor, basically subsume two of the suspects, nitrification, Waltonism, along with Toyotism in lean production, put all three of them together and basically say, this is the future vision of labor uh, that's subsequently going to have a major impact on the world. Uh, and then drop the McDonaldism and the post-sportism. Post and out of that bundle of three divisions of labor come one that's pretty darn positive for uh, balance of payments and the U.S. economy, and the other two are have some really negative consequences biggest one basically being the balance of trade, negative balance of trade. So, uh, so I'll leave it there. Uh, this is a big broad sweep. And when we get to Dorina, she'll talk about one company and keep it simple and throw in the whole world out there. But, uh, but anyway, this is kind of like what we're kind of seeing is this is the roadmap for the world division of labor for maybe the next 50, 52 well, a couple of hundred and fifty to sixty years. So, questions, comments? Why don't we wait for uh, questions, comments until you both? Oh, until so both. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm so quiet right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're. Moving from uh, this uh, broad presentation at the macro level to discuss a little bit what happens at the micro level. So I want to take you on a journey uh, on the shop floor to actually see how diversity works in a lean context at this corporation that has the pseudonym Kaizen Motors. So it's a Japanese, top Japanese transplant that's non-unionized. And these are several issues that I would like to cover with you. So basically, Tom and I had done interviews with 150 workers, most of them assembly line workers at this um, uh, major uh, plant. And we looked at several um, aspects of diversity, gender, race, age, and the interactions between um, temporary and permanent workers in teams. So we're looking a lot at what is the dynamics of diversity in teams? Um, as you all know, there's a lot of corporate rhetoric on diversity. All um, major corporations, respectable corporations, have very ambitious diversity visions. But actually, we wanted to see what does diversity mean to people who work on the floor? How do they get along with each other? What's the nature of their interactions? men and women working together in the same team, white and non-white, young and old, temporary and permanent. And there are several theories that we explored, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but we looked at um, the theories of Eli and Thomas from the Harvard Business School that looked at three different ways of conceptualizing diversity. And uh, their opinion is that most uh, corporations use the one in the middle, discri discrimination and fairness. So according to uh, these authors, um, maybe 80% of the companies promote diversity programs and policies because it is fair to do so. Um, other companies, in addition to that, uh, will adopt an access and legitimacy approach, um, thinking that, well, if we incorporate diversity, for instance, more minority workers we can also um, open our products to new markets, to new diverse markets. So just an example would be you have a dealership and if you have their um, uh, salesmen who are bilingual, all of a sudden you open your business to a new market. 
these authors think that um, the last theory on the slide, integration and learning, would be the most comprehensive diversity theory of all because it um, uses the assumption that diversity should be incorporated in the core functions of an organization. So it shouldn't be just symbolic, it shouldn't be just fairness, but basically in every decision you should try to incorporate uh, diversity suggestions and ideas. So you can have sustained benefits for the long term. Uh, in our book we also looked at the revised contact hypothesis. Uh, simply put, this theory says that um, the more different groups have contact with each other, uh, they're going to start to lose the stereotypes and prejudices that have about each other. But uh, this theory works great when we have some ideal circumstances, and those are the uh, four that I mentioned. So contact works great when people have equal status. Uh, when uh, people work on interdependent tasks, like in a team. So that's exactly why we thought that this theory would be best applied to a team environment. When there is leader support for diversity that actually enforces and legitimizes diversity. And then uh, the fourth one would be um, when um, you know, team members get a lot of pride from uh, producing a su successful outcome working together. So, um, uh, in the end, based on the data that we've collected, we developed our own theory that we called Team Intensification Theory. Uh, based on the interviews, we have uh, concluded that, um, let's see, that um, uh, due to the pressures of working in a lean environment, there are several advantages that actually would work well and promote diversity issues a lot more. Uh, for instance, uh, based on our interviews, we've noticed that um, women and minorities actually uh, develop uh, a new, a new um, uh, se se sense of identity. They take a lot of pride in their work and uh, they have a lot of satisfaction for making it in a very intense pace, uh, high pressure environment. The disadvantages of that would be that the more people work together, for instance, in a team structure. So uh, at this particular organization, we talked to workers who worked for 10 years, 20 years together. Uh, some of the disadvantages of people working for such a long time together would be, um, um, interpersonal relationships. So we said affairs and dating between team members and we're going to talk about that uh, really quick. These are some of the methods that we have used to collect our data. We've done interviews with people on the shop floor so the majority of our interviews were done with workers uh, who were pulled from the assembly line but uh, we've also used um, satisfaction surveys. We've done interviews with top managers of this uh, uh, corporation with diversity officers. Uh, so we tried to have a complete picture of what's going on at this uh, company. Um, I think one of the most fascinating chapters, and just going to show you the book um, that probably you're going to find on display soon, it's um, the chapter on women that we call the Queens of a Line. Um, the, Quantitative data that the company had showed that women in this factory had a higher job satisfaction than men and they didn't have any explanation for that. So I think what was really ideal and helped the company was that two independent outside researchers came to research this issue. We've um, done in-depth interviews with the workers so they could fill in the blanks. Okay, so why are women happier than the men at our plant? And there are several um, issues that contributed to that. Um, first of all, um, the Japanese plants, uh, when they started to open factories in the U U.S., didn't had I don't know how to put it, quite, um, let's say, the best startup in terms of gender issues. So in the late 70s, early 80s, um, 
we have several examples that happened at Mitsubishi, Mazda, even Toyota or Subaru Isuzu in Canada, um, showing that, for instance, in the initial uh, phases, uh, some of these factories didn't even plan to have restrooms for women because there was an assumption that women will not want to work on the shop floor because, well, in Japan, there were, um, um, you know, women were mostly interested in doing office work, so the office ladies. Um, there were some rough interactions between Japanese managers and uh, very assertive American female workers. Um, uh, what, in 2006, I think there was a major scandal with a uh, CEO of Toyota North America who was involved in a sexual harassment lawsuit that settled for an undisclosed amount. So several issues show that um, there were some problems there. So we wanted to see uh, how the situation looks like 20, 30 years later after these factories opened in the US because there, there wasn't any literature on this uh, in the past 20 years. So we were happy first to find out that nobody questions women's ability to perform work in such a highly physical demanding environment. So it, we interviewed both women and men and we were happy to see that um, uh, male workers are just as supportive of having female team members and who work side by side with them and uh, they don't question their ability of doing that kind of work. In fact, based on the interviews, it, um, you know, we, we got the impression that finger dexterity is a lot more important than physical strength. So, so women were not at a disadvantage there in any way. Um, many of the female workers that we've interviewed lost between 25 and 60 pounds only in the first six months of their uh, employment there. And um, I'm sure uh, some of the women around the room know that we're all very happy when we lose a weight, isn't it? So that contributed somehow to uh, a very positive image about themselves. Um, 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 they felt a lot better about them and their bodies. And actually working on the line is like a continuous uh, fitness exercise, right? So that kept them in great shape. I. Uh, use that expression over there, uh, overemphasis of femininity. Actually, I was surprised when I went there and started to meet with uh, the women on the floor um, to see how much attention they paid to their appearance. So in this factory, like in most of the auto industry, you know that women uh, amount to only 25% of the number of auto workers. The same situation was in this plant. Uh, so women were a minority. Um, uh, I've, I've noticed that they paid a lot of attention to the way they looked when they went to work. So there was, uh, you know, uh, perfect makeup every morning, uh, perfect nails, uh, perfect uh, hairdo, and um, um, we, we, we talked a lot about this because I was really impressed with, with uh, uh, their appearance so um, I came to find out later after performing more interviews that that has something to do also with working in a man's world, in a male environment. Some of these women wanted to show that we're still feminine, we're doing this kind of work, but we're, we're still feminine enough, uh, we're, we're not becoming masculinized. And um, another um, aspect of this was that uh, some of them were really, I think, happy to have the attention of men. Um, so as I've mentioned, uh, uh, women had higher satisfaction and pride in the work that they've done. Um, as you know, the Japanese plants usually open in um, economically disadvantaged areas. So uh, these women, before they become Kaizen employees, had minimum wage jobs, maybe barely making 15,000 19,000 uh, a year, and all of a sudden now they're jumping to very generous paycheck. Um, they take a lot of pride in their work and in their new, let's say, found place in their communities. They, they, they take a lot of pride in how their neighbors or their spouses look at them now when they make, some of them, 
um, who become team leaders, $70,000, $80,000 a year. Um, the chapter, as I said, is called Queens of the Line because it seemed, uh, based on the interviews, that um, they really enjoyed actually being, having this minority status. So that's why uh, we, we, we felt that this is the best expression to, uh, to show their feeling of empowerment. We're proud of what we're doing, we're proud that we make it, and we're also enjoying feeling special because we're in a minority. So contrary to you know, the research that shows that usually minorities feel marginalized or discriminated against, in this case they felt empowered, they felt that they were the queens of the line. Um, about safety and quality, um, it seemed that um, women had overall less injuries than men, short-term injuries, but they had more instances of carpal tunnel. Uh, anybody knows why? Why do women have more carpal tunnel than men who work on the line? Any speculation? Yes, Gail. You think? Well, see, some of the tensions that happen, for instance, the Subaru Zuzu plant um, between men and women were that uh, some of the women tended to hide their carpal tunnel because they didn't want the men to think that they're weaker, that carpal tunnel is a women's disease. But other sociologists of work think that it's because of the second shift that they do at home. Basically, when they go home, they continue using their hands a lot, doing laundry, doing, you know, cooking and all that. So basically, their hands never get to rest. So, so that's why long term, there are more um, uh, instances of carpal tunnel. But overall, um, men had the impression that uh, women pay a lot more attention to quality than themselves. That overall, women have more attention to detail and some of them put it like, it wrecks, it wrecks their brains when they see a defect. So uh, obviously they said it, it's really a great plus to our teams when we have female team, mem team members because you're going to point out to things that sometimes we overlook. And I have here several quotes from the interviews just so you can have a, uh, you know, the workers' voices, not just our interpretation. So one woman says, Gina says, it is very empowering for us women to work here. I like doing the same things that men do. I do as good a job as theirs, if not better. I started work here out of a fight because my husband says that I cannot do factory work. Well, I wanted to prove him wrong. Then Lloyd, the team leader says, the woman in my team is just as good as any man I've got. There are some jobs that she does not care for, like going underneath the bumper. They are not physical, but uh, she does not like them. She will trade off for jobs that are a lot harder, for instance. We have men that come in saying that the shoulder is killing them and that uh, they would like to trade off too. So that's not just a gender issue. Mary says, men take their job as a joke. Women take it seriously because they know a time uh, one out of ten that they are the ones who bring the money home to the children most of us here are single women so we take our job seriously uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this issue of um, most of us here are single women because actually most of the people in my sample have happened to be single women or divorced uh, since they um, um, became employed at this plant okay other quotes says Gregory, for instance, a male team member. I like working with women. It's not that you mess around on your wife, but you gain a perspective if she gets upset on you and you do not why. Uh, if I ask my male friends, he tells me, you know women, they're all crazy. That's the answer you get from a guy. The women will tell you, well, let's go back and find out what you, why your wife got upset with you. You remember you forgot it was her birthday. So they will wake you up. So basically, it talks a little bit about relationships and how 
um, you know, sometimes this team environment um, adds a positive climate. It's not just strictly work rela related, but it's also like a diversity lesson in itself. Nick talks about another female colleague. She was born with it. It is her nature to pay attention to all the details. We're happy when she pats us on the shoulder about the defect. She uh, tells the team leader, hey, look, this guy missed something down the line. We're not upset about that, no way. It saves us 30 minutes because the whole group has to be here after shift to fix the problem. So we tell her, thank you. We go home early thanks to you. And then Terence talks about one of his uh, female colleagues who was recently diagnosed with cancer. It was devastating to learn that she has cancer. The whole team was grieving. They all encompassed her. She came back after a double vasectomy and nobody could hold her down. She's a strong woman. We gave her a good rotation and the whole team supported that. She's stronger now because she realizes how much everybody cares about her here. So it's, you know, this team concept that's uh, taken to a new level where, you know, they all become a family. There were also some other issues that we've noticed, for instance, female teams, whole female teams had a different dynamic than whole male teams. Uh, in a, they, as they put it, in the female teams, there's typically a lot more drama, a lot more catiness, a lot more fights. Um, whereas men, if they fight, I think um, they get over it uh, quickly. Okay, so this is John, uh, who was just one man in a team of women. In a female team, it's a lot more drama. They could not get along, and I got caught up in the middle being the only man. I wouldn't say all women are like that, but just these particular women. They would complain about anything. They did not like the rotations, the job. They would bring their problems from home to work. I just stood back for a while and let it happen. I tried to keep my mouth shut. I wanted to stay out of it. We, the men, get together and laugh about it. You get in trouble if you get involved. They tried to involve us too, but I stay strong. I was in that team for five years, so I put up with it for a while, and then I decided to transfer. I even left day shift for night shift, and I enjoyed that. I felt that they went to HR enough, so I didn't want to complain about that too. So there are many, many sides of how these you know, gender relations um, play out in teams. And um, this leads us to uh, the next chapter of our book. Um, which was called Sexual Attraction on the Line. This was something that we didn't have in mind to include in our project when we started the interviews. But um, interview after interview, there were a lot of patterns that went us back to that. So as um, I've mentioned before, I think the team intensification processes uh, led people to develop very strong bonds with each other that sometimes really undermine their family life. So, in my sample, uh, almost 80% of the people I talked to actually got a divorce after they were hired at Kaizen. So after 10 or 20 years uh, there. So it just showed how team undermined uh, family life. So they got a divorce and remarried with some of their colleagues at work. And obviously when that happened, they had to be reassigned to different teams. What was very interesting was that uh, the company knew somehow about it. They had an idea, but uh, they didn't know to what extent, how, how, how generalized the situation is. Uh, so I've used here several um, uh, words as they put it. There is a little bit of playful interaction here on the line, a little bit of innocent flirting or silly stuff. And then one of, uh, uh, one of the team members explained it, Janine, she says, I spend more time here than with my family. If you think about it, it is so naturally that you're going to have some attractions. You're looking at the same Joe every year, he's going to start to look hot to you. But people should handle it responsibly. And then Gina, a female team leader says, affairs, that goes quite a bit here. Management does not encourage it, but looks the other way. They need to do a study on what the divorce rate is here, and I would like to see that. All the women on my team are divorced or single mothers. That is true. Almost all the women in my sample were divorced or single mothers. So we thought that this could also be an 
effect of this you know, women empowerment, where let's say what unintended consequence of um, the women empowerment through their jobs at, at this factory. The uh, race relations was also an interesting chapter. Um, um, uh, same thing, uh, uh, the Japanese transplants have also an interesting history in terms of race relations. Uh, when they opened plan, plans here in the US, right in the late 70s, they were perceived by some communities with mixed emotions, right? Uh, because they were, uh, uh, what? Um, I, I remember there were banners with, uh, if you buy Jap Japanese cars, you apply for welfare in Japan or something like this. There were, there were some plant in Ohio where workers welcomed the Japanese managers with a t-shirt with the Hiroshima bomb on it. Uh, so, so they were perceived differently by communities in the beginning. Uh, I think there were some protests about the Honda plant in Marysville, Ohio, that they imposed a uh, residential radius of 17 miles, so that excluded uh, many minority communities from uh, being hired on that plant. Uh, so we were very curious to see how the situation looks like uh, now at this plant. Uh, based on the interviews, um, we, we got the general uh, pattern, general opinion from both white and non-white workers that um, they tried to adopt a colorblind attitude in teams. Um, uh, there is a lot of joking in teams that's very, uh, we found very interesting jokes that people were, were talking about diversity. As you know, usually people uh, joke a lot about differences, not about similarities between people. So sometimes race or country of origin would come up in uh, all this, um, um, let's say, playful interaction, as they put it. Humor is very important on the line. So um, in order for people to survive these very hard jobs, you need to joke about stuff. Um, and race uh, sometimes came often. Um, uh, but as you know, this could be very tricky. Some people can get easily offended when you joke about somebody's racial background or country of origin. Overall, we were also surprised to find out that African-American workers had a higher satisfaction in the plant than the Caucasian workers. The same thing, the plant knew about it, but they didn't have an explanation for it. So uh, it was a similar situation with the women's status. The African-American workers felt that they were given a chance to um, um, have a great career for life, uh, uh, long term and um, they took advantage of this opportunity and that they are given a lot of opportunities to promote. They feel respected. They feel, again, very respected when they go back in their communities to say, I work for Kaizen Motors, you know, I'm sometimes making six-figure salaries. So they, they get the elevated status um, of respect and satisfaction. And I have here, again, some quotes. Um, for instance, from Brad, a black team member who says, Kaizen presents a lot of opportunity for us. If you look at the outside world, African Americans do not have any opportunities. Coming here and making the same amount of money as the person next to you and being able to afford the things that you want for your family, you cannot be anything but happy. Then Warren, African American group leader says, I worked here for 30 years and this is the company where for the first time in my life, I like coming to work. When you come to this door, if you want to make a difference and be successful, you can. If I prove myself, I can smoke anybody. Kaizen gave me a chance to prove myself. Okay, and the uh, uh, you know, list continues. Uh, Kaizen is a very good company to work for. I have been treated super. You wouldn't understand how it is to be on my side. Kaizen gave African Americans a better opportunity to reach a goal they never thought they would reach. It brings wealth into the African American community. Okay, a, a younger African American team member says, "Kaizen took us away from the bad neighborhoods we were living in. It gave us a better outlook on life. Kaizen work is not easy, but at the same time, it gives opportunities. A lot of people feel blessed and happy to have this good job." Okay, 
These are the rules, this is the system, and you have an equal shot at being promoted. African American workers are exactly where they choose to be. We are the internal treasure of Kaizen. I thought that was a very nice way of putting it. Okay. And then uh, I've told you that there was a general perception that, so, so let's say, white workers thought that they are colorblind. And uh, when asked about this, African American workers said, it is not true that they don't, do not see color. The first thing that you know about every person before, if they're cute or ugly, women or men, is the color of the skin. It is automatic, it is instinctive. This is our thought process, the way our society taught us. I like to look at the color quality society, not a colorblind society, okay? And then an African-American uh, woman, I, th I thought that was very interesting. If you look at the statistics, you'll find a lot more black women than white women as factory workers. That's because black women are a lot stronger and we don't have as many options. Many of us are single parents and we have to feed our kids and we're determined. Okay. Now age is another very interesting chapter here. Um, and uh, again, we were surprised of what we found out. Um, you know, uh, I think at this factory, uh, uh, more than 50% of their workforce was hired at once in the uh, early 80s. Um, so it's almost like they had a cohort model. Uh, we've interviewed a lot of people who are now in the mid 50s, almost 60s, who worked for the company for 20, 30 years. And we asked their question, Old age and lean production, is there a misfit? Um, sometimes from the interviews we got um, uh, various opinions, especially from w older workers complaining that, I don't think I can retire from here. Really, I've worked here for 20, 30 years. Uh, my body is sore, I have injuries. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to re retire with this company because most of the easy jobs had been outsourced. Now, like maintenance, um, custodial, had been outsourced. So it's really hard for people who are close to retirement to move into um, easier, uh, easier jobs. Um, overall, based on the interviews, we thought that um, the young and old play two different roles in teams, and we use the, these metaphors, the gunko and the gurus, to show what their roles in teams are. So we use the expression gunko for the younger workers. The interviews show that they are a little bit more uh, impatient, more uh, eager to prove themselves, and the older were like gurus, you know, they would be the, uh, you know, the, let's say the older brother or father who would pat you on the shoulder and tell you, I would be a little bit more careful if I was you. I've done that before and I got hurt and I got this injury. Um, we've also noticed a segregation, segregation by age. So the first shift was a lot older than the, than the second shift uh, because you can get promoted to first shift based on seniority status. So unfortunately it looked like this factory had the major division. If you went in, in the morning, you know, it was an older factory. When you went in the evening, it was like a completely different organization because you had only workers in the 20s and 30s. So obviously the dynamics there were uh, different. Okay, so let's see, an older team member says, we do more movements in one day than most people do in a month. So we lose our elasticity and our joints on a long run. They take the easy jobs away. The group absorbs these jobs and it's a little bit faster and faster. And that adds up over years. I don't know how long I can continue to work like that if I can grow older here. Another older worker says, the older are smarter, they go around the block. The younger work the hardest way. The older will tell them, what are you doing? There is an easier way of accomplishing this. Then a younger uh, worker says, I would work with a lot more older team members in my team because they are more forgiving if you make a mistake. They are more apt to coach and to work with you to help you learn. They are not in a hurry and you do not feel rushed. So this is how uh, age plays out in our discussion on diversity. 
I think the most critical chapter of the book, uh, it's about temporary employment, and we called it the underdogs of the line because it showed uh, the unfortunate situation of the temporary workers. So at this company, um, actually, temporary employment is used as a filter for permanent employment. There is no other channel of being hired permanently. There are some positive effects to that, but there's also some negative consequences. The positive aspect of hiring temporary workers is that whenever you have team members who are sick, um, and obviously, you know, the, ol the older they get, they're going to be a lot more on restriction, so they'll have be on longer medical leave, then you need to rely on the use of temporary workers. In our book, we even ask if they can be called peripheral workers when actually the system would not work without them. So in every team, you would find at least one or two temporary members. Uh, so the system really could not function without them. Uh, overall, I think there were like 20% of temporary workers uh, uh, at this company. That affects sometimes the team environment. Um, in some teams, workers didn't talk to them for a month or two. And when I ask them, why do you think that this team worker feels so marginalized? The permanent workers would say, well, we don't know if he's going to make it. I mean, usually 50% of them don't survive the first two weeks. So then the a permanent worker saying, I don't want to get attached to this guy. I get to know him and then in two weeks he's not maybe not coming back. So, so this is a vicious cycle because then the temporary workers cannot feel integrated and cannot feel as being part of the team. Um, so some of the negative effects are this structural inequality that basically you have a two-tier system of workers in the factory. So they all do the same job. Uh, they work in the same team side by side, but the temporary workers will make half of what a permanent worker makes. Um, there's high turnover with temporary employment. Um, I think overall workers had, temporary workers had to work 18 to 24 months to prove themselves in order to uh, be offered a permanent job. There are issues of inclusion and fairness. Sometimes the temporary workers feel excluded from company functions, um, let's say Christmas gifts, lotteries, uh, f festivals, these kind of activities where they really don't feel like they're welcome as part of the team. So um, uh, there were situations of scapegoating where temporary workers are found guilty for some mistakes that the team um, has made. And I have here also some quotes from them. Uh, Kaizen Temp and union organizer at a supplier plant. Oh yeah, I have seen people crying. I've cried many times, but I try to hold my mouth. I've seen people curse, throwing things. We can get in a lot more trouble than a team member. They can walk us out. I have seen people going crazy. They go nuts. A temp is on a probation for six months for arguing so badly with his team leader. He was very professional, but you could see his eyes steaming. Then Willie, a team member, says, Temps, they do not want to speak. They do not want to stand out. They want to fit in and blend as easily as they can. I did not see any temp standing out and suggesting something because they just want to blend in and be like everybody else. Full-time members overall are more concerned with safety. Temps will try to prove themselves so they can be hired permanently. They go, go, go as fast as they go, and that's when you can make more mistakes and hurt yourself. And actually, there are situations when temps hide their injuries so they can receive that permanent uh, employment. A temp says, I don't like my team leader, but I respect him. He did not train me. He's just jump, jumping all over me. Team members ask me, why does he talk to you like this? And I'm responding, because I'm a temp. That's why I can't say nothing to him. 
it was hard to get up to speed. There was a guy in particular who wrote me a lot. You suck, he told me. He probably thought that this is joking, but he was also cheating me a little bit to work faster and harder. A team member says, if I could, I would hire them on the spot. I would like to see all TAMs be full-time members. TAMs come and go. The stability of your team is always in question. I would rather work with people that I know and see every day than uh, with TAMs who are going. Um, so there's a lot of um, turnover in teams. Okay, so uh, several of the recommendations that we've made in our final report for the company was red flag attention needs to be paid to TAMs. Usually in all the traditional works on diversity, you're going to see people paying a lot more attention to gender, race, age, but I think temporary workers sometimes are neglected. Uh, and um, in our study, it shows that, that there's major inequality and fairness issues, and they need to be protected. Uh, if this is really the pool that you're going to uh, base your future um, employment. We've also made suggestions related to uh, shift work. Uh, ideally, we would like to see um, shift works that are a little bit more age balanced because if you have an older shift and a younger shift, then really you cannot make that transition of organizational knowledge, of organizational learning. So, so if the older workers play the role of being the gurus, they really need to work side by side with, with the younger workers. Um, we, I mean, uh, based on the interviews uh, and the documented evidence of and pandemic dating and affairs, we suggested that the company should involve uh, and invest a lot more in work family programs uh, so they can support the working families that are, um, uh, you know, struggling with, uh, you know, balancing, balancing work and family life. And we've also raised attention about the protection, protection of older workers. They really should not have to retire early just because they cannot keep, keep up with the demands of, um, of working in such a high, high pace environment. Um, at the end, we also would like to learn a little bit more from you. So um, we have listed here several diversity programs that usually companies um, rely on. Uh, diversity training, div uh, recru recruitment and retention from diverse pools, mentoring programs, diversity celebrations, festival, concerts, sponsorship of diversity events in the community, like community engagement we've, we've seen in several presentations. So now, um, We've shared the results of our research with you, but we'll also like to learn a little bit from your best practices with your employers. So we would like you to discuss with your colleagues at your tables uh, in a, let's say, 10 minutes exercise, and let us know what do you think that are the most successful diversity programs promoted by your current or former employers, and what do you think are the least effective diversity programs? And then, can you please get back to us in 10 minutes? And Tom and I will also answer your questions after that. Would you go back to the previous slide? Please? To the previous slide, and I'm going to leave it here. These are just some examples. Maybe your employers do a little bit more than that. <laughs> 